Good evening. Welcome to our midweek meeting this Wednesday evening. We're in the book of Isaiah tonight, Isaiah chapter 43, and we're going to pick up our reading where we left off last Wednesday night at verse 14. Let's read together Isaiah chapter 43, beginning at verse 14 and reading down to the end of the chapter in verse 28. We read, Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins, thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities." I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be just justified. Thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be together this Wednesday evening around your word. I ask, O oh God, that you would bless and fill each one who is listening in, that you would use this time to encourage us and strengthen us in our faith, that you would cause us to be conformed to the image of your dear Son and to bring you glory. Now, bless me and help me to think with clarity and to speak with clarity and help each one, Lord, to grow uh, as we indeed increase in the knowledge and in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, I said last Wednesday evening that Isaiah chapter 43 is readily divided into two parts. Verses 1 to 13, we looked at last week, which focuses on Judah and Israel's witness as a nation. Whilst in verses 14 to 28, uh, the passage speaks of their relationship with the Lord. In the first half of this chapter, the Gentile nations were called to account, and they were required to explain to God in his courtroom why it was their trust was in idols and in other gods. Now, in the latter part of this chapter, it is Israel who is called to account. And the Jew is asked that in the face of such a gracious hand, why he would act in rebellion against the law of God. And it's to that second portion of Scripture that we turn this evening, where the people of God are encouraged by what God will do in the near future, in verses 14 and 15, in terms of uh, dealing with Babylon on their behalf, and what he will do in the distant future, from verses 16 to 21, as we think about the millennial age. And notice how both sections are introduced by the words, thus saith the Lord. And notice too, why God is doing what he will do. In the first place, we're told in verse 14, it is for your sake. But then in verse 25, we're told it is for mine own sake, for his sake. You see, God always keeps his glory to the fore. Now, here we see three aspects of the story of Judah. We see something of her past. 
We see something of her present as in the time of Isaiah, and we see something of her prospect as to what God has laid out for her in the future. Now, with respect to her past, Judah, we know, was destined for some 70 years of Babylonian captivity. God had determined it so. Isaiah had declared it so. Jeremiah declares it so. But so that she would not lose hope, she should look back on her history and remember God's dealings with her in the past and recognize that as he has been faithful in the past, so he would be faithful in the future. Notice how the Lord reveals himself to her. He is your Redeemer. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah. He is your Holy One, the Creator of Israel and your King. Now, given those titles, is it really likely that this God is going to abandon them? that he's going to forsake them, that the nation will disappear altogether once they enter into Babylon. Well, of course not. So he tells them in the first place how he's going to rectify their situation. First of all, he places them in Babylon. Now he's going to explain how he's going to bring them out of Babylon. And he tells them how he's going to bring down the Babylonian empire. You know, Job 12 and 23, Job said this, he increaseth the nations. Speaking of God, he increaseth the nations and destroyeth them, he enlarges the nations and straighteneth them again. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 6, godly King Jehoshaphat prayed, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? God overrules the empires and the kingdoms of men. And we see that here, for barely has the Babylonian empire arisen than God is declaring its fall. Verse 14, for your sake, I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, whose cry is in the ships. And the uh, Babylonian navy, we know from history, ruled the waves. The Babylonians used very glorious vessels that were built in Phoenicia, now Lebanon, and they navigated the waters of the great Euphrates River as well as uh, they, they, would have, uh, they, they would have navigated the Persian Sea. They would have uh, held that particular stretch of water. But God would turn these great battleships, uh, of which they were so proud, into rescue ships. And these ships which once terrorized the nations would now be used to evacuate the Babylonian army from King Cyrus of Persia and his invading army. God would deliver them from Babylon. The Babylons would run someday just as the people of Judah would run when the Babylonians came into their territory. And so just as surely as God had delivered their ancestors from Egypt, he would now deliver them from Babylon. Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinct, they are quenched as tow. Now these verses are obviously a throwback to the Red Sea crossing. You know, sometimes in present difficulties, it pays to look back at past victories. And Judah was encouraged here to reflect upon their deliverance during the time of the Exodus, but not to rest upon that victory. For now, uh, they, they, as, they, as they consider that particular deliverance, a greater deliverance comes into view. A greater victory than that which was experienced unto Moses is now set before them, a victory that they could never before have imagined. Look in verses 18 through 21, and we see something of her prospect. God says, remember ye not the former things. Don't dwell on the Exodus. Remember it, but don't dwell on it. Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I gave waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth 
my praise. Now, verses 18 through 21 are dealing with Israel's prospect in a much more distant view, and they're descriptive of the millennial age. You know, the past deliverances cannot compare with the future blessings that God has laid out for the nation before them. Remember ye not the former things, he says. Consider not the things of old. You know, uh, whilst there may be some good to be had in looking back and seeing the blessings of God in the past, the believer is always encouraged to look forward, to be forward thinking, to be progressing, to be on the march. And uh, the Lord says to these people, behold, I will do a new thing. God is always doing a new thing. He's always at work somehow, some way in our lives and directing us down a new path. Now, the the restoration of Israel and the return of the Jewish people to their land would be like a new exodus. Now, obviously in history, that happens in terms of their return from Babylon, but in terms of prophecy, this happens when the Lord brings back the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth to inhabit Israel and to gather around the government of Jesus Christ as he rules and reigns from Jerusalem. And all of that period, God says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. You notice the Red Sea crossing is described in verse 16 as a way in the sea. But the, uh, the, the return and restoration of Israel that is yet future is a way in the wilderness. God was going to bring them through an arid period of their history, the valley of dry bones from which the nation would be restored again. And that's where Israel is today. Israel today is a land which is rebirthing, but is certainly not in the place where it will be when the Lord Jesus returns, because the greater bulk of Jewish people still live outside the land and are scattered around the world. But even we ourselves sometimes find ourselves in such a place in life that we might describe as a wilderness, as a desert land. There are times when our spiritual lives, just like the nation's life, uh, seems to arrive at a wilderness, a place of, of wandering aimlessly, of getting nowhere, a place of hunger and of thirst, of no provision, a place of isolation where there's no uh, companionship or no support. Some of us are in that right now where you're isolating. You've had to cut yourself off from friends and family and colleagues, and you're basically uh, living alone without any companionship, uh, at least for a limited period in time. It's a place of sorrow, a place of defeat is the wilderness, a place where there's to be no real joy, a place where there's to be no victory. You remember how the Jews of old in the wilderness wanderings would cry and, and they would murmur and they would complain. There was very little joy in their camp. As you read the story of Israel coming out of Egypt and you read the leadership of Moses, even Moses held up his hands in despair and he says, what have I done? You know, I'm not the father of these people. I'm not the mother of these people. You know, Lord, why have you entrusted these people to me? So the wilderness can be a place of sorrow. It can be a place of defeat. It can be a place of pressure where there's no peace. There's no relief. And again, we see that even in the wilderness wanderings of old, where the people wearied of eating manna every day. It was like there was nothing fresh for them. There was nothing new. Even though the manna was in itself a grace of God, a provision for them, it wasn't the same in their minds as the leeks and the onions and the garlics that they apparently enjoyed in Egypt. It was a place of hopelessness where there were no future prospects. And remember, there was a whole generation who died in the wilderness. But here's the thing. God can make a way. He always does. And if you're in the wilderness tonight, if you're in isolation tonight, if you're in a place of hunger and thirst tonight, if you're in a place of sorrow or defeat, if you're in a place of pressure or hopelessness, I want you to know that God can make a way for you that God can come and rescue you from that place. And he will, because he always does. For the people of Israel, this way is uncovered in the coming of the millennial kingdom. There we're told the beast of the field, in verse 20, shall honor me. The dragons, the jackals, and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. Notice that phrase, my people, my chosen. That's why God is dealing with them in this way. 
They are his people. They are his chosen. You know, no matter how much you might like children, there's no children like your children. My children are better than anybody's children. That's how every parent feels. And here in uh, Isaiah, again, chapter 35 and verse 1, we read of this millennial age. Uh, again, we've covered this passage already in our studies, but it says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. In verse 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Now there's joy, now there's happiness, now there's victory. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land, the springs of water, in the inhabitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And then in verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow shall flee away. Notice they are his people. That's what Isaiah 43 says. His chosen. His people, his chosen. Remember the opening verse of this chapter where the Lord says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. How important it is that that, that was the relationship they had and have with him that they are his, that they are called of him, that they are chosen of him. Jeremiah the prophet reminds us of the same truth in Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 11 when he says this, For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory. But they would not hear. Thou art mine, the Lord says. You're my people. You're established for my praise and for my glory. And then verse 21 reminds us, And them that in all of his dealings, God's honor is paramount. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praises. Now, this is where our security as believers rest. You know, there are many Christians uh, that are insecure in their salvation. There are some who believe that they can lose their salvation. You know, there are some who decry those who preach and teach that once you're saved, you're always saved, as though somehow or other that's the gateway to antinomianism, the gateway to living however you please without respect to the holiness of God. Of course, that's not the case at all. That's a complete misrepresentation of the doctrine. But there are many Christians who fear that somehow, if they overstep the line, they're going to lose their salvation, that God, as an Indian giver, is going to take back the gift that he gave them of eternal life, that he will withdraw his grace and just give them up and just abandon them and just forsake them to the the fires of hell. But remember this, if salvation is of works, then it's not of grace. And if it's of grace then it cannot be of works. The purpose for our salvation is the glory of God. And our security rests upon his honor and not upon our effort. It rests upon his promises and not upon our endeavors. Well, you might say, well, what about our feelings? What about our sins? Can we just sin any old way? Can we just behave any old way? Can we do whatever we please? Well, what about Israel's feelings? What about a nation that gave itself to idolatry? What about Judah's feelings? A nation that became careless and indifferent in their religion? A nation that became cold toward God and the things of God? What about their feelings? Well, here we read something of her presence. Look in verse 22. This is where she was at as Isaiah was writing these words. It says, But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, But thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings. Neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied wearied thee with incense. Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money. 
Neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. What an indictment this is upon the history of Israel. Her whole past was full of failure. And how damning that she could, should consider her relationship with the Lord as a weariness, as something tedious, as something humdrum, as something mundane, as though God was no different from the gods of the nations. Thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, but thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. And this takes us right back to the very beginning of this book, where the initial accusation of the prophet was just that, that they were weary in God and that they were weary of God. Look in at chapter 1 and verse 11, where the prophet says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of fed, the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the bloods of, blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hands to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incenses, and abomination unto me, the new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with its iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul heareth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Judah's religion had at best been reduced to mere form. The people cared not one jot for the Lord or the things of the Lord. They were simply doing the bare minimum to get by. They were simply resting and satisfied upon ancient traditions. And in our text there in Isaiah 43 and verse 23, the Lord says, Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering. God says, I'm not forcing you to do it nor weary thee with incense. I have not put this upon you. This is something you can choose to do or not to do. He denies having wearied them with his demands, having wore them out somehow. In truth, he was seeking service from the heart, but they were relaying to him nothing but religion that was steeped in legalism and mere ritual. That's worship at, that is half-hearted at best. And then in verse 24, the Lord says, Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Sweet cane, or calamus, was used in the production of anointing oil. And of course, the fat of the, any animal as sacrificed belonged to the Lord. But they were bringing small and lean creatures to be sacrificed. In many ways, they were doing what their descendants would later do during the ministry of the prophet Malachi. Malachi makes a similar complaint of the people in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 13. Behold, what a weariness it is, they said, of the table of the Lord. And you have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and you brought me that which was torn and lame and the sick. Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? And the outcome of that was that God rejected rejected their worship. In chapter 2, in verse 17, he says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? The same thing was said in Isaiah's day. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Now, of course, we know that God is never truly wearied. The term is used as a metaphor to express his exasperation and his disdain for their offerings and, and dead religion. Is God any less wearied with our half-hearted worship? Is he any less exasperated when Christian people give in to legalism and buy into form and ritual? I think not. Now, it's at this very point that you would imagine that God is going to judge them. 
God is going to cast them off. He says to them, you've wearied me. I've, you've made me serve with your sins. You, you, you come into my presence and you've not dealt with the heart and, and you carry on in your iniquity and, and, and you're dragging my name through the mud and all of this. This is the moment when our Arminian friends, those who say you can lose your salvation, would expect their salvation to be lost. But instead of an outpouring of God's wrath, we are met by an outpouring of God's amazing grace. You see, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Look in verse 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Oh my. In the words of one writer, Isaiah leaps straight from the God burdened by his people's sins to the God who blots them out. Aren't you glad that in Christ your sins have been blotted out, literally being wiped away? Why would God do that? Why wouldn't he just dispense with these people, destroy these people? Why wouldn't he just judge these people? Well, the answer is in the text. He will do it for his own sake. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. Again, we see how paramount God's honor is to him. You know, a man may, be, may sin so as to give his honor unto others, according to the book of Proverbs, but God will always ever maintain the honor of his word. He is a God who can be and should be trusted, and therefore he is a God who is worthy of our service and worthy of our devotion. And when he says, I give unto you eternal life, guess what he does? He gives unto you eternal life. So that you can say, I know I'm saved. I'm sure I'm saved. And finally, just as he had called those Gentiles into his court in the earlier part of this chapter to explain their idolatry, he calls these Jews into his court to explain themselves in verse 26. Put me in remembrance, he says. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Thy first father has sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. He effectively says, state your case. He says, remind me, tell me, why it is that you treat me so badly, that you worship so badly? Justify your actions. Explain to me why it is that you're bringing me small cattle. Why it is that you are, are bringing me, that you have bought me no sweet cane, you've brought me no anointing oil. Why it is that you're, that you're failing me, uh, that, that, you, that, you, that you're uh, failing me with the, the fat of your sacrifices? Of course, they cannot explain. Their failures are not recent, but their failures go back to the very beginning. Thy first father hath sinned. There's the root of their problem, as it is the root of our problem. It all goes back by nature to a man by the name of Adam, our first father. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And our natural bent, all of mankind, is one of opposition and rebellion toward God. And this waywardness was in view even among those who had the pastoral care of the nation. Notice he says of them, thy teachers, your prophets and your priests, they've also transgressed against me. And as a consequence, the purpose of the nation is not annulled. The nation is not dissolved. They do not lose their purpose in terms of God's eternal plan and program, but they experience temporal present judgment. They are chastised there and then as a nation. Verse 28, Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. They would fall into Babylonian hands. They would be disgraced. They would be disdained by their enemies. And let's make no bones about it. Sometimes our sufferings in this life are as a direct consequence of our own sin and actions. And sometimes we are, as Christians, subject to the chastening hand of God that he might correct us and return us unto himself. Well, what a challenge all of this is to us. I wonder this evening, have we listened to the voice of God regarding his past displays of mercy and judgment in our lives? 
I wonder, do we believe God when he promises that he's able to do something new, that he's able to make a way for us in the wilderness? Do we understand that God can surpass all our expectations in his dealings with us? That he is the one that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Whatever the wilderness of our lives, God can make a way for us, a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So how are we doing at the very core of our mission? I mean, you and I as Christians and we corporately as a church, you know, the reason God created us was exactly the same reason he created Israel. He created us for himself that we should be, as a church, a people who belong to him and offer up praise and sacrifices of praise continually unto him. Are we doing any better than Judah? Perhaps. Perhaps not. But one thing is for sure. We can no more justify our sinful behaviors than they could. Thank God tonight for his redeeming grace. Thank God for his mercies in the face of our sins. Thank God that our sins are blotted out and completely forgotten by God so that they will never be brought up again and that you and I can enjoy fellowship and our relationship with him. May God bless these thoughts to your hearts this evening and I look forward to joining with you in prayer in just a few moments. Lord bless you. Thank you.